I had an abortion three years ago, and I've had horrific things said to me. I've had somebody spit in my face in the street. I'm in Dublin ahead of a historic referendum that could pave the way for abortion being legalised in the country. We are passionate about respect for women. A bit of respect. Yeah, we are. I've just spoken with a young woman who came over from Ireland this morning to have an abortion. She's had to lie to her family, lie to work. This country is failing women. How does that make sense? How is that fair? People are voting on whether to repeal the Eighth Amendment to Ireland's constitution, which gives an unborn fetus equal rights to life. Essentially what you're doing is replacing the right to life with the right to kill. End your hypocrisy, decriminalise abortion. I'm not a vessel for anybody else. This is without a doubt the biggest issue facing young people in this country today. Events are set to move rapidly now in relation to the proposed repeal of the Eighth Amendment on the constitutional rights of the unborn. With just under three months to go before the referendum on abortion, the issue divides the nation. Those who want to keep abortion illegal and those who want to give women the right to choose. I arrive in Dublin as the campaign battle begins. People hear of repeal and they think of me, the young girl who is flipping with her decisions um, and is doing it as, as a form of contraception, and then that's not the case. It's people who have families who, who can't afford to have no kids. We're doing it for those people yeah. who have to go through that already. understand what it means to be young, Irish and pregnant and face the hard decision on abortion, I'm meeting Lucy, who's been campaigning on this issue for the last two years. How did you get involved with campaigning for this? Um, I got involved through campaigning because I have a personal experience of travelling for an abortion. Um, yeah, I found out I had an abortion three years ago and found out I was pregnant and just wasn't ready to be a mother at that time. I was on the pill. Yeah. So my doctor told me I was pregnant and I said, no, I, I, I can't be. And um, I didn't even know if I could ask about abortion. Yeah. I was terrified of being found out, really. It felt like a dirty, felt like a dirty secret. When you told your story, how, what was the response? There was obviously a bit of backlash. I mean, I've had horrific things said to me. I've had somebody spit in my face in the street. But more so than not, it's been overwhelmingly positive. It's been so many girls saying this happened to me as well and I've never told anyone. There's such a stigma that you're so scared of, of being judged for not wanting to have a baby, for getting pregnant in the first place. What would it mean to you if the laws are pills? It would mean that one day if I have a little girl, when I'm ready to, she can do what she wants with her body and she'll have complete control. For me, it's so easy to sympathise with this because I grew up in England where abortion, every, like, everyone speaks about it, it's not a secret, it's an option for you if you need it. It's still a huge decision, but it's just mad to come somewhere that feels so close to home, you know, and yet it feels like a million miles away. What really strikes me is that no one speaks about it because it's so taboo, because you can be ostracised. People are scared and people are ashamed, and I think that's really sad. Religion has a strong influence in the Republic, with almost 80% of the population baptised as Catholic. And for those like Lucy, who want to overturn the Constitution, it means persuading a nation to abandon its fundamental beliefs. Well, we believe from the moment of conception that there is an individual, there is a, a separate person in the womb, uh, very dependent upon the mother, very dependent upon her, uh, for everything, but will continue to be dependent upon the mother long after birth. We believe that the direct 
um, abortion of a child in the womb is wrong, is morally wrong and can't be justified. Father Michael's view may seem out of touch, but with the country's religious backbone, the No campaign here is by no means a marginal voice. And in the months leading up to the referendum, opinion polls show support for a No result is increasing. Thousands of people have taken part in a march through Dublin city centre to demonstrate their support for attaining the Eighth Amendment. This is an annual event that's held in Dublin and they think it might be the biggest one yet because obviously it's coinciding with the upcoming referendum. So there's lots of people um, from all over the country who are joining. There's definitely an age divide here between the two groups. That's kind of the most obvious thing. Didn't see very many people kind of over the 50, 60 mark at the pro-choice rally. And that definitely seems to be the main demographic here. 100,000 people are expected to march today, including those from Northern Ireland, even though they can't vote. Legalising abortion in the South would put Northern Ireland at odds with mainland UK and the Republic. I've come to meet Lucy, a student who's travelled to the march from Belfast. Abortion has so many, like, um, effects, physical and emotional effects on women. Like, for example, abortion, there's been a lot of um, studies done that actually shows an increase in breast cancer with abortion. There was like a study done over 30 years, it's called the Ferguson study, and it actually shows an 81% increase in mental health issues in post-abortive women. What I'm learning is it's obviously a hugely divisive issue. Mm -hmm. Can you see any room for a middle ground? Mm. No. Middle ground would be abortion in certain circumstances. And we're talking now 98, even over 98% of abortions in Britain are for purely social reasons. Do you view it as murder? Um, no, I wouldn't word it that way because, you know, then the next question would be, oh, who's the murderer? But it is the killing of a human being. Thank you so much. Ellie, thanks a million. The No campaign of fighting to protect equal rights for mother and fetus. Um, I'm just trying to find you. For some, this isn't a moral debate, it's a matter of life and death. Gavin? Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. When did you first become involved in the whole campaign? I suppose it would have been around a year ago. It's hard to come out as, you know, being pro-life in Trinity. How do your conversations go with people who are pro-choice? It, it, it depends. You get a lot of looks and, you know, scowls and, and whatnot, and a lot of people shouting things at you. Why do you think it is so divisive? This is without a doubt um, the biggest issue facing young people in this country today, without a doubt. Um, it's so divisive because it's so personal. And why is it personal for you? Yeah, um, so my mother fell pregnant with me when she was 15. Um, and so my grandparents had decided that, you know, given the circumstance, she was so young, you know, it was a one night stand, he completely left the scene, um, that the best thing would be to send my mother to England uh, to procure an abortion. Uh, she stayed over there for a month or so uh, with family. And it was that month's time and, you know, that allows them to deliberate and come to the conclusion that, you know, at the end of the day, I was a human being and it was wrong to end my life. And um, so they brought her home. Without the Eight Amendment, there wouldn't have been that time for deliberation. And it's very probable that I wouldn't be here today. So which way do you think it's going to go? God. I really hope it's pro life side. I come out with a win. However, historically, you know, constitutional referendums in this country have come to and out, like really down to if, a few percent. So I'm, I'd like to say I was extremely confident about this, but I'm not. But if this rally, 100,000 people, you know, is says anything, I mean, I think it says a lot in our favour. No appeal. Yeah, I can understand that. I think, you know, in his head, he is a baby that would have been aborted and he wouldn't be here. Um, and I think that's what I'm starting to learn. That's, that's maybe the issue here, is everyone has a personal story. And that's hard to change. The decision to abort is intensely personal. But what if you do find yourself with an unwanted pregnancy? 
So I'm on my way to meet Rita, who is a campaigner and lawbreaker who helps Irish women access pills for abortions inside the country. And she risks a prison sentence of up to 14 years every time she does that. Hi, Rita. Hi. I'm Ellie. How's it going? So are these the pills that you'd be sent if you... So these are the pills that women on web send. I'm so just having these, is that illegal? No, it doesn't seem like it is. They're not recreational drugs. If you give these to somebody and that person uses them to have an abortion, then that's illegal. You've helped them to have an abortion. We organised abortion pill train to recreate an action that feminists took in the 70s when contraception was still illegal in Ireland. They went up to Belfast on the train, they got contraceptives, they brought them back into the south and waved them around the train station and said, you know, if you're going to enforce the law, arrest us. So we wanted to recreate that. So we had the abortion pills posted to Belfast and we brought them back down to Dublin and we held them up for the world to see, for the media to see, and then we took Mifepristone to demonstrate that it's safe. But the other reason was political, as a protest, to say to the government, this is a reality. Abortion pills are being used in Ireland despite the Eighth Amendment. End your hypocrisy, decriminalise abortion. An argument that I'm hearing from lots of people who are anti-abortion is that that is a life, that is a baby. And how do you argue with that? Sometimes you want to say is, well, don't have an abortion yourself. But the reality is abortion is not this moral decision. Abortion is about ending a crisis pregnancy. And that's a situation that you can get into no matter what your politics are. So between 2010 and 2015, more than five and a half thousand women requested abortion pills from women on web. You can't deny that they're still happening anyway. Women are just being sent overseas or they're taking pills at home on their own. And surely that's safer to be done with a medical professional in a clinical environment. For some, there is another way. It's legal, but expensive, and it still carries a risk. So I'm just on my way to an abortion clinic in Liverpool, which is where lots of Irish women travel to terminate their pregnancies. Um, and huge numbers of Irish women come to the UK every year to have an abortion. I mean, women are paying anything between 500 and 3,000 pounds to terminate their pregnancies in the UK, which is just a huge amount of money. There's an Irish lady here who would like to speak to us, so I'm about to go meet her now. Just said the hardest part, that she's had to lie to her family, lie to work. Um, make up a story as to where she's going and why she's not around for a day because she feels that she can't tell them that she's travelling to Liverpool for an abortion. Because there's this sense of stigma and she doesn't know who she can trust or who she can tell or what their reaction might be. So I've just spoken with a young woman who came over from Ireland this morning to have an abortion. She's nine weeks pregnant, she's 23. She's been up since half past two this morning. Um, had to travel from Southern Ireland up to Dublin to get a flight um, and then has flown over and the travel alone has cost her 600 euros. Around 4,000 women a year travel from Ireland to the UK for an abortion and today this clinic expects six Irish patients on its list. This is where she'd have kind of um, all the checks would be done, the anaesthetist. So this is where kind of I meet the, meet the patients and I talk to them and you know find a little bit about them. Do you find that by the time that women from Ireland have travelled, in comparison yeah. to maybe people from England, they seem a lot more certain. I've never had an Irish patient who has got to this point and then has said, you know, no, I've changed my mind, I want to, to go back. It's such a massive kind of effort to actually come, that actually they have to be absolutely certain this is what they want to do. So this is the uh, operating theatre. A medical abortion is basically taking tablets um, to mimic what would happen um, in a miscarriage. For surgical procedures, carried out just using a little suction method. Is there an average age of women you see coming in here from Ireland? I'd say it's similar to what we see kind of across the board. I mean, we've recently had some, you know, a girl as young as 12 um, from Ireland. You know, a 12-year-old um, 
is not able to, you know, to consent for, for, for sex. Um, uh, so it's statutory rape. Did that make you realise sort of the severity of this issue that, you know, a mum has had to bring her 12-year-old child across the country? Absolutely. I mean, it sickened me really to think that a little girl has been, you know, sexually assaulted, um, a pregnancy has been produced, and, um, in, you know, in their own country, in, you know, Western civilised Europe, um, you know, her government won't allow, um, you know, the decent thing to be done and, and, you know, that pregnancy to be ended. You know, I just think that is absolutely disgraceful. Personally, as a doctor who carries out abortions, how do you feel about campaigners on the other side who think that abortion shouldn't be allowed? The life I see is that woman who's, you know, sitting in front of me, who was on the theatre table. Uh, that's the life that's, you know, that's important. Um, and, you know, the, the unborn fetus is not a life that has the rights that this woman has. Being at the abortion clinic today made me realise just how isolating the experience of travelling is for Irish women. Not only have they been through the trauma of finding out that they're pregnant when they either don't want to be or can't be, they also then have the trauma of an abortion and the trauma of travelling outside of that home country, often alone, often in secret. It's not just about crisis pregnancies. One of the arguments for changing the law on abortion is in cases where, sadly, the baby has no chance of survival. We found out at a scan that our daughter had no kidneys. My body was crushing hers. On top of that, she had a very severe form of spina bifida, and if she was born alive, she wouldn't have been able to take a breath. She would have suffocated. We chose to travel to Liverpool Women's Hospital when I was 24 weeks pregnant and induce our labour. They knew we wanted our baby, but they knew that we were making a parental decision for her. This was the kindest option. Just a few days after we buried Jessica, we can't keep expecting the women living in Ireland to be burdened by the laws here. We hope that on May 26th, we are waking up to a yes result and that we can finally stop punishing tragedy. Thank you. So I'm just on my way to Jennifer's house to go and meet her. Um, she's going to tell me a little bit more about her own abortion story. Hi. Hi, Jennifer and Ellie. Hi, nice to open your hug. How are you? Good, you're Nice fine. to see you, thank you. Hey, how are you? This is um, her memory box that they gave us in the hospital. And then this is the blanket she was wrapped in this when she was born. Mm -hmm. It's just lovely to have. Yeah. There, her little hand and her footprints. When they brought her off to, to dress her, for us, they did all this. You know, we were so glad of it because we would have never thought of anything like this. Mm -hmm. And then there's just some, these are the photos that they took. That's her with all the teddies. So they're all the ones that are in her coffin. Yeah. You're just, it's disbelief. You know, you're, it, it, you just can't believe you're in that position. Can't believe that it's your baby that has gotten this diagnosis. Like, these things don't happen. You know, they happen to other people, is that what you think? They can't give you much here because their hands are so tied by the law. Yeah. And it's like, you know, not that they're nearly afraid to tell you anything, but, but they don't know. We looked like, like we were bereaved parents already. Mm. We were grieving our baby, she just hadn't died yet. And then they called us in for the scan and we just said, is, is there any change? And she goes, no, your, your baby has deteriorated even more since your scans two weeks ago, since the initial results. And she said, and you're doing the right thing for her. And that's the first time that anyone had said that to us because they can't say that here, they can't advocate for it here. Yeah. And that's what we needed to hear. We needed to know, yes, you were doing the right thing for her. In cases of fetal fatality, many Irish women like Jennifer choose to end their pregnancy in the UK and return home with their baby for a funeral. Under current law, these children aren't recognised or recorded as having lived. In cases like Jennifer's, these pictures are the only record she has that her daughter Jessica ever existed. Hearing Jennifer's story, was so moving and it is tragic what she went through. I can really understand 
why she has been so vocal in campaigning to change this vote. And that's the first time I've heard a woman who's had an abortion speak about it in terms of having had a baby. And seeing those photos was really, really powerful. For Jennifer, it's clear the law needs to be changed, but some fear abortion could become too accessible if it does. And back home in Britain, there are those who feel our laws have turned abortion into an acceptable form of late contraception. So I'm at the March for Life in London, which is a big anti-abortion rally, and there's going to be lots of speakers here today and workshops, so I'm going to try and chat to some of the people and get their take on the situation in London Island. I was just wondering, is this accurate in terms of features at 12 weeks? These are absolutely anatomically accurate. You can check all this against any medical textbook and find that actually that's what an unborn baby looks like. Um, and so why do you think it's important that people see a model like this? Because it shows them that before birth, this is a member of the human race. It's a tiny, perfectly formed human baby. And when an abortion is performed, that baby's life is taken. And um, have you been following what's happening in Ireland? For decades now, the Eighth Amendment has been a beacon, a pro-life witness to the rest of the world. This is all about protecting Ireland's unborn citizens. Is there room for compromise in that we can acknowledge that it is a little baby, but then in cases of maybe rape or incest? So if somebody's been raped, we feel they need love, they need compassion. We say quite constantly, abortion is never a solution. It's not a compromise. It's in, we're talking about a human life here. And there is nothing out there, absolutely nothing, that suggests that abortion will ever help a woman. The graphic images of aborted foetuses seem to be a real part of the campaign strategy here. And I wondered if everyone is as resolute as Antonia. Hi, Hi I'm Ellie from the BBC. How are you? Is it... Good, thank you. Uh, yeah. Do you think there's room for compromise in that there's not lots more room to support women in crisis pregnancies, but also there are some cases where maybe abortion is what the woman wants? Women don't want abortions. You know, we're made to, to bear children. Like, that, it, it's not... It's not a disease, it's not something bad. It's just that's not always the right timing. So something has happened that they want to rewind. So we need to look at beforehand then, hang on, well, what's gone wrong for you? Because I think no woman wants an abortion. No woman wants to end the life of her unborn child. I suppose some women don't want children, though. Many, many people bring children into the world that weren't planned, that weren't necessarily wanted, that very, very much become wanted children. So what do you think is going to happen in Ireland with the referendum? Somehow it's seen as the politically correct thing to do to vote yes. But my understanding of the canvassing on the doorsteps, those people are saying, no, we absolutely do not want abortion on demand in this country. Ultimately, if I say it's OK in this circumstances, what I'm saying is sometimes it's OK at the end of life of an innocent human being who has never harmed anybody. I truly believe we've gone backwards, not forwards. And I hope with all my heart that Ireland won't, won't follow suit. As campaigning in the referendum on the Eighth Amendment enters its final few days, two separate opinion polls at the weekend suggest that the yes side is ahead. I mean, you can see there's so many more posters all over the city now. Um, it looks like there's loads more no posters than there are yes, which I think is quite surprising in Dublin because the sense I get here is that a lot more people are on the pro-choice side of things. They're literally everywhere, on every street corner, every lamppost. There's like three posters. It seems like there's been a bit of a frantic push um, ahead of the referendum at the end of the week. With the media focus on both campaigns reaching fever pitch ahead of the vote, I've come to catch up with Gavin, who's speaking at an anti-abortion press conference. How's it been since we last saw you? There's a lot more canvassing going on. Um, a lot more social media presence. Yeah, everyone's just kind of getting a bit tense now. It's two days away, you know. Stakes are high now, stakes are high. Yeah, what's uh, on your agenda today? Then I have college stuff to, to get in. I have an exam tomorrow, and then another exam on the 25th. A lot of canvassing. Do you think people know what they're voting for in this referendum? Essentially what you're doing is replacing the right to life with the right to kill. Is that what you see this as, the right to kill? Yeah, 
I mean, we're removing the right to life from a specific class of human being. So we are getting rid of the right to life. And in my opinion, we are bringing in the right to kill. What, what happens to a woman who doesn't want a child and finds herself pregnant? I think those women um, could look at perhaps adoption, let's say. Also, what if the father wants it, you know? Should the father have any say in this? Do you feel like it could be seen as her being forced to have a child? Well, look, I, I, I'm not in the business of forcing anyone to do anything, you know? I'm, I don't want to force anyone to do anything. Um, but, again, the Constitution acknowledges the right to life of the unborn child and has a duty to vindicate and protect that right. I was in unwanted pregnancy and I'm alive today because of the Eighth Amendment. So how are you feeling about the next couple of days? Confident. And I've met people who would vote yes, but they see this as being fundamentally far too extreme. He's obviously so busy in the run-up to this referendum. And I think that shows how important it is. He sacrificed revising for his exams to go out on canvas. It made me realise that there's no compromise for someone like Gavin. Fundamentally, he thinks abortion's wrong and that's not going to change. In the final days before the referendum, the Dublin streets are lined with campaigners trying to win over undecided voters. Everywhere you look, there's people with leaflets and signs for both sides. I'm not a vessel. I'm not a vessel for anybody else other than myself. And for me, that's the, the same argument here, that, you know, ethically speaking, I have to have that autonomy over myself and I have to make those decisions for myself. <laughs> there was quite a lot of commotion over there, someone was quite angry. I've just experienced a lot of people that uh, very quickly throw up the middle finger, very quickly shout and swear. As you can see, there's, there's a lot of anger, like, but... Um, How does that make you feel when you see that? Yeah. yeah. Speaking to campaigners just 12 hours before the vote and hearing that there's so many people who are still undecided was really surprising. I mean, this must just be so overwhelming if you still don't know what you want. Polling stations in most of the country will open at 7 o'clock today. Ready? I think so. Yeah, it's as ready as I'll ever be, I guess. It's the end of a fiercely run and emotionally charged battle. I'm with Lucy and Gavin, who I first met three months ago as the campaign began. I'm feeling good. Confident. Today they'll yeah. vote yeah. in what is expected to be one of the biggest turnouts in Irish history. I imagine that no voters feel really quite concerned that they might wake up tomorrow and everything could have changed. And then for yes voters, it feels like this could be a landmark moment for women's rights in Ireland. You are listening to a special edition of Morning Ireland on referendum count day. Counting is due to get underway officially at nine o'clock. I declare the count centre here open. The vote today will shape the future of Ireland, not just in the Republic, but also in the North. A yes result would put Northern Ireland under pressure to re-evaluate its laws on abortion. Politics there are already unstable. With the exit polls starting to point to a yes, I wanted to check in with Gavin. Hey, Gavin. Hello, how are you? I'm all Yeah. Okay. How are you feeling? I'm hopeful, but, uh, you know, it might be in vain. We'll, we'll see, we'll see. Do you think there's still a chance you could win? Never say never. Is it likely that we're going to win? Probably not. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. I can hear some cheering down here, so I'm going to go see what it's all about. The 
there's loads of people celebrating behind me because they've just had the results from Dublin Central. About 18,000 in favour of yes and around 5,000 in favour of no. So I've just seen Simon Harris, the Irish Minister for Health. Um, he was sort of the catalyst to this referendum. I'm going to try and catch him for a chat. What does this day mean for Ireland's future? I think this is a very significant day uh, whereby over, an overwhelming majority of people have said we want to be able to look after women in our own country in a compassionate way, where women have voted thinking, if this was me, how would I like to be cared for? And men have voted thinking of the women in their lives. Up until this point, under the Eighth Amendment, uh, Ireland was effectively saying to a woman in a crisis, take a plane or a boat. Today, we're saying to the woman, take our hand. Um, up until this, we were saying to women in crisis, you're on your own. And today, we're very much saying, no, we want to stand with you. Yeah? Yeah. How do you feel knowing that your story contributed to this? I'm just the girl that you sit next to on the bus, or the girl in the coffee shop, or someone that you walk past on the street and that it's happened to, and, and we're the everyday people, and we're the everyday stories. And I have to say it for those girls like me, so that they know they're not alone. With all votes counted at Dublin Central, the overall result for the Republic of Ireland is about to be called. So Mr Dublin Castle, where they're waiting for the last couple of constituencies to declare their vote. Seeing everyone shouting, cheering, there's loads of signs saying the North is next. As people hope that the laws will be changed in Northern Ireland following this vote. Votes in favour of the proposal, 1,429,981. <laughs> On May 25th, 2018, the Republic of Ireland voted overwhelmingly to legalise abortion. The spotlight now turns north. First abortion and the possibility that new services in the Republic could be extended to women from this side of the border. A pro-choice rally has taken place outside Laganside Courts in Belfast. At the demonstration, three women took what they said were abortion pills. Right now in Northern Ireland, if you are raped and you have become pregnant as a result and seek a termination, because of these laws, you would face a longer prison sentence than the person who attacked you. So we recognise there's a really strong case for removing this piece of legislation to create these new laws which are around medical access rather than criminalising women who are put in very difficult situations. <laughs> 